It is certainly good to be here tonight. I uh, can't remember <coughs> what number I have spoken on, but I can tell you that I am so thankful to be a part of any good work, and I do believe that these lectures and other works that you have done have been so beneficial through the years, and I'm thankful that I'm able to be a part of it. I pray that uh, as we study, we always realize the benefit of not only studying the Word, but the fellowship that we have. And it is such a great encouragement to me, and I hope that you will be blessed by the time that uh, we spend together also. You know, we look at the uh, book of Jonah, and uh, it is one, that song that we just sang, beautiful song, but sadly it doesn't fit Jonah. You know, here am I, Lord send me. Well, Jonah had a little bit of a problem in that regard. You look in the very first uh, verse there, he says, The word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great uh, city, and cry against it, for the wickedness has come up before me. That really sets the tone for the whole of the book. That was God's purpose. That was his desire. Jonah, go to Nineveh. It's a wicked people. You preach, and we will find the preaching that I bid thee. The sad thing, you look at Jonah, and there's so many things that, that come up. One, of course, is a lot of people don't even believe it. And so it's a good book, but it's just a myth. There isn't really anything there that has to do with truth. God communicated a lot of things. You know, the creation, a flood, a whale swallowing somebody. All of these were just little fables or myths there because man really couldn't understand the intricacies of science, and that was the best way for God that he felt to communicate, is to give them little fictitious stories. I can remember sitting in a study with a man and a family, and their Catholic priest was there, and that was the first time that I had somebody just blatantly tell me, you know, that it's just a myth, nothing true. Well, I didn't let that pass. I pointed out that if, in fact, this book is not true, we've got some grievous, grievous problems. One of the basis of that statement is you go over to the book of Matthew, and you find the Lord there is discussing several things with uh, those who were leaders, the scribes and Pharisees, as he was wont to do. And you find there in Matthew, the 12th chapter, that as he speaks to them, it says, certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered and said, Master, we'd see a sign from thee. Now what it was, they'd already seen the miracles, but now they wanted something greater. Well, you know, that's we can't deal with the miracles you've done, but show us a sign, show us something greater. And so he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. There shall be no sign given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was, in, was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so the Son of Man shall be three days, three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation, shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. From that, we learn that, as I said, there's some grievous problems. People look at that and they say, well, you have an old story. But if this is just a story and it's not real, the problem is, Jesus taught it was. Jesus believed that Jonah was a literal, historical individual. Jesus believed that that whale story, three days, three nights in the belly of the whale, were in fact factual. Jesus believed that the preaching of Jonah to a city in Nineveh was real, and that the response of the people was in fact real. So you have to look at it and say, as we study this book, we better study it earnestly as it is the truth from God. Because if it's not true, if it's just a myth, what about that story of some man being put to death in three days and three nights in the tomb and then rising? Just a story. And if it's just a story, in Romans the first chapter, in verse 4, we find that he was declared to be the Son of God by power, or with power, by the resurrection from the dead, just a story. The fact is, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 19, if this is just a story, we are of all men most pitiable because there is no hope. 
This life is the only hope we have, and we're basing it upon a story, a myth, about some man who maybe he wasn't even real. Maybe there isn't a Jesus. I mean, there is no stopping place once we deny the reality of this. But the fact is, it is true. We're noble. Acts 17, verse 11. So we search the Scriptures, whether these things are so. And as we search the Scriptures, Jesus says, Jonah was a real man. Jonah was swallowed by a real fish that God prepared. Jonah preached unto a nation, Nineveh. Those people repented. And just as Jonah was in the belly of that whale three days and three nights, I will be three days and three nights, and then I will rise. What a glorious lesson it is for us. If we learn nothing else in the book, that in itself would suffice to give us reason to study but as you look at the book, you find there are so many other things in there that can help us. Romans, the 15th chapter, verse 4, we find that these things are written that we might have patience and comfort through those scriptures. For our learning is why they're written. So let's look, let's go on and consider more about the book now that we know that it is a true account, and we're going to approach it that way. We look and we find out more about it. One of the things that was uh, pinned in the assignment was what you need to do is look at the man. Be sure and take a look at the prophet and see who he was. Well, with Jonah, that's a little bit of a problem in the sense of looking and seeing who he was before. Because there's not a whole lot said about it. We do know that this isn't the only time he was mentioned. You look and you find in 2 Kings 14, that he is spoken of as a prophet, and here he's mentioned as the same one, the son of Amittai. So we know he's talking about the same person. But he was a prophet of Israel, the northern kingdom. He was only one of three literary prophets, that is, Hosea and Amos being the other two. But you look at the book and you find, as you read about him, that he labored during that time in which Jeroboam II was there, maybe a little bit earlier is when he started it, but he was likely a very popular prophet because if you look at 2 Kings 14, he spoke about the northern kingdom surviving and prospering. They didn't do that for a long time, having been taken out of the way in 722 B.C., never to be brought back again. But you look and you find he was no doubt popular at that time, but other than that, before his life that we read of in Jonah, we don't know anything about it. If you want to get to tradition, the Jewish tradition is that in 1 Kings 17, you find that there was the widow of Zarephath that Elijah raised from the dead. Jewish tradition is that was Jonah. But that's all it is. There's nothing that would ever confirm that. A lot of traditions given that kind of interesting to look at, but really don't base anything on them. But then you look and you think, okay, Jonah, and uh, there is something, as Bill mentioned, here's a problem in Jonah's mind, because here is a prophet of the northern kingdom, and he's told to go to Nineveh and preach. The northern kingdom was one that was suffering at the hand of the Assyrians. Nineveh was the capital. And so now he is told to go and to speak unto these people. You find in Genesis the 10th chapter is the first time that you have Nineveh mentioned. Nineveh was stated as being a city that was built by Nimrod, was the, king, the capital of the Assyrian Empire, as you read in 2 Kings 19 and Isaiah 37. It was located on the Tigris River. Its population was great population. It was a great city. In chapter 3 and then in chapter 4 it's spoken of as being a great city and in chapter 4 it's mentioned if you want to get a, an estimate as to the size of it, whenever he went into the city it was a three day walk around it. it makes it a pretty good sized city. And then you find that the number of people there, there was 120,000 the Lord said, uh, he, the number in the Bible is six score uh, six score thousand, which comes up to 120,000. But you look at that, and these weren't the population of the city. These were the ones who were of age that they couldn't tell their right from their left. In other words, children. So 120,000 little ones, and God is saying, you know, how can you not be 
joyous that they have recovered or been saved. But then if you take that out, a normal population, there's about a fifth that would be that age in a normal population. So that put the city itself at somewhere between six and 700,000. That's a pretty good sized city. But it was a city that, as I said, it was a capital city, so that's really nothing that's uncommon. It was huge, well populated, wealthy at this point, but they needed to realize their wickedness was there. It is prophesied, Jonah talks about the fact that they're going to be destroyed, and then as we'll find, he got upset when they weren't. But then later on in the book of Nahum, it is spoken a prophecy against Nineveh, that's the thrust of the whole book, and then also Zephaniah speaks of it. And in 622, or 612 rather, the city was destroyed. And so ultimately it did end up being destroyed. And we don't have any other word about it until you get to the New Testament. Now historically, it is of course known where it was, and it's been in prominence in the news of late, uh, in the last few years. In 2014, most are aware of the workings of ISIS, the uh, purveyors of that uh, uh, Islamic religion, and they are very much attuned to destroying everything that they can that's of a cultural value to anybody. Mosul is a city most of you have heard of, and the archaeological studies show that's where Nineveh was located. The city was in that realm there. And in 2014, they destroyed a very special site to a lot of people. I'm not much on giving to Bible lands and putting a great deal of prominence. God didn't ask us to do that. But Jonah, when he died, some people uh, think traditionally we don't know when he died or what happened to him, but some people think that he was buried in Gathifer, which was where he was born, that's the city he was from. But then tradition later on said no, there was a tomb built and a great place of memory set for him in and of itself. And so in 2014, that was destroyed. And much to the upset chagrin of a lot of people. But Again, that's tradition that goes there. But now let's look to the book itself. And this is where we learn about Jonah as he became. And we can also learn about ourselves. One of the great things that I have in studying the Word of God is to look at ourselves and see, where am I? You know, I, I personalize the Bible when I study it. And I try to find out where I am. And so as I read Jonah, we're going to look, and there are four chapters, and you find that it can be really set forth as a study of Jonah. One of the things about the book of Jonah, uh, as you noticed in the study of Joel, it was prophecy to the nation. Here's what God is going to bring upon you. Here is what you can look forward to. So the emphasis was on the message and the people to whom it was given. Jonah isn't that way. Jonah, yes, he was told, go to Nineveh and preach. But the emphasis through the book is on Jonah. So we're going to look and we'll learn about Jonah, but we can look at ourselves. I think every one of us can find ourselves in the book of Jonah. You can find yourself in chapter 1. Jonah runs from God. Or maybe you can find yourself in chapter 2 where Jonah runs to God. Or chapter 3 where Jonah runs with God. Or chapter 4 where he leaves and runs ahead of God. But those four things can be set forth as an outline of the book and also an outline of Jonah's life as we see it. Jonah running from God. Jonah running to God. Jonah running with God. Or Jonah running ahead of God. So let's look and begin in chapter 1 and see if we can find some things there to let us know about Jonah, let us know about the life he lived, and consider our life also. In chapter 1, you find the book simply begins, as we said, with a, a command. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. So God is giving him a charge. Now, one of the things, and as we go through, I'll give us some lessons also to consider. And one of those things there, remember what Nineveh was. 
Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian nation, not of the descendants from Abraham. And so you look at this, and what you find is God has been, is, and always will be concerned with all mankind. A lot of people, they get stuck on this idea of, uh, you know, today it's a focus, you know, well, the only thing matters is Israel. And they have no concept of what Israel is. The fiscal nation of Israel means nothing. Spiritual Israel is the church. But the concern that God has in bringing people to His Son in the church is for all nations. So God desires that all man, all mankind be saved. John 3.16, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That didn't come about, His love, His concern for the world didn't come about just whenever Jesus came to this earth. It's always been there. And the book of Jonah stands as a lesson to that. Go to Nineveh and preach unto them. Acts 10 and verse 34, God's not a respecter of persons. That's a lesson after the conversion of Cornelius that was set forth. That in fact, God is concerned about those in all nations. And again, that's something God has always dealt with. A lot of things could be said on that, but study that matter. But then you look and you find Jonah's response. You ever heard of somebody doing a 180? I mean, here it is. Here I am, and then somebody says something, I mean, boom, I'm gone. That's Jonah. It says, Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish, which likely was the city from which Paul hailed, but not certain there. But he rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So you look at it, and you think, here it is, Jonah, all he had to do from where he was in Gathifer, go about 500 miles north and east to get to Nineveh. Instead, he started a journey which would be 2,500 miles. He didn't make it that far, but it would have been about 2,500 miles to Tarshish, which would have been on the southern shores there of, of Spain, if that's where it was. But anyway, it's a long journey, so he thought he would flee from the presence of the Lord. Verse 4, if you mark your Bible, that's one you might circle. But the Lord. How many plans have been disrupted? Because we thought what we'd do, we didn't like what was there, we were upset about something. But the Lord, the Lord is in control. Throughout this, you find Jonah sought to flee from God's presence. Now how do you do that? Ask the psalmist. No, whether shall I flee from thy spirit? You can't. But Jonah, for some reason, decided to do that. Well, God brought this great wind, which was a tempest in the sea. The ship was likely to be broken, just burst asunder. The sailors that were there, they began to be distressed. They knew. They were throwing the things they counted as cherished overboard to lighten the ship. They finally went down to Jonah and said, what's going on? Go to your God and find out. They drew a lot to try and find out whose fault it was. It fell on Jonah. No shocker there. God's in control, but the Lord. And so the lot fell upon him. And then he makes an amazing statement. In verse 8, he said unto them, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which has made both the sea and the dry land. See a little bit of a problem with that? Here am I, Lord, send me. Well, no, I'm not, no, I don't want to go now. Don't want to go there. But that's what Jonah was. Empty claims will never suffice for a relationship with God. He said, well, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord. I know He's the creator of all things. But here he is running from Him. He is a man who, like many today, Matthew 15 and verse 9, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines, commandments of men. Jesus would ask, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Matthew 7 and verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. You see, it's not going to suffice. And it's an amazing thing. Despite what he had done, the sailors didn't immediately cast him overboard. They tried to row to shore. That, that's amazing to me. 
they had a lot more concern than what Noah, than what uh, Jonah did. But anyway, they tried to row the shore, but the Lord, again, the sea was so tempestuous <coughs> that it would not allow them to come in. And then they didn't find the disciple. We need to cast him over. And it became clear then, here's what God's plan was. Because we're told in verse 17, the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. That's God's plan. That was going to happen. He wasn't going to let the sailors take the ship to shore. He wasn't let Jonah escape from him. Here was what was going to happen. God is in control. You look at that. And by the way, a lot of people know what kind of fish was it? Was it a great white shark? Was it a maybe a sperm whale? Maybe it was this kind? I can tell you exactly. It was a great fish that the Lord prepared. If you go beyond that, you're in trouble. But God prepared a fish. Jonah ends up inside of it. In chapter 2, you find where Jonah now runs to God. Being in the belly of the fish, he determines that his situation is dire. And so we read that Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord. And then in subsequent verses, it talks about all of the things that came upon him, about how he felt he was going down in the sea, into the belly of that fish. Nonetheless, Matthew 5 and verse 3, you find the blessing of affliction there. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Jonah got to the point. I can't do it. I tried doing things my way. I was going to flee from the presence of the Lord and look where it got me. And so he cried unto the Lord. 2 Corinthians 7 10, godly sorrow worketh repentance. We need to get to that point sometimes in our life, don't we? that we have that poorness in spirit. So he pleads, <clears throat> prays, and God hears him. The Lord set, spake unto the fish, <clears throat> and he was vomited out on dry land. Can you imagine the joy he had? He was now out of that grave, the sheol as he called it. But you look and you find then in chapter 3, Jonah now runs with God. You find that Jonah realized that God's way is the only way. Now, you all know Yogi Bear. It's deja vu all over again. You ever heard that? Well, deja vu is whenever you hear something or see something, you think, well, didn't I just? It's the feeling that something has happened. Whenever Jonah comes out of the whale's belly, you know what God says to him? You look there in chapter 3, and it's deja vu. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Nothing's changed. Jonah, here is your task. You shrank back from it. You ran from me. You have found out that you cannot live that way. You have turned to me. Now you know what I'm going to tell you. Do what I said. Preach the preaching that I bid thee. Would to God a lot of preachers would underline that one, wouldn't they? Preach the preaching that I bid thee. Second Timothy 4. Can you, can you imagine, you think Paul, whenever he wrote to Timothy, and whenever he wrote to him, he said, Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. The time's going to come when they'll not endure sound doctrine. Well, what do you do? Preach the Word. When he wrote to Titus, the situation you're in is terrible. Evil beasts, liars, slow bellies. What do you do? Speak the things that become sound doctrine. You see, Jesus had given that message. Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel. I mean, that is the Word that I preach. And I don't have the right to do it. <coughs> Many people think they do. Or they think they'll just be quiet about it and not say anything. Jonah teaches us you can't do that either. So now Jonah runs with God. He went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. That's a good start, isn't it? What am I going to do? Colossians 
Tell them to do all things in his name by his authority. So he goes into Nineveh. This time, though, he is going and a realization of what the Lord has said. This great city, three days journey. Jonah entered in. He preached. But the normal course of events wasn't there, it doesn't seem. You know what the Lord said in Matthew 7, 13 and 14? You see, there's two ways. There's a broad way that leads to destruction. There's a narrow way that leads to eternal life. He says, few there be to find that. But here is Nineveh, a city that's given over wickedness. And whenever they hear the word of God, they cried unto the Lord. They repented of those things. The people in Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put sackcloth on from the greatest even unto the least of them. Even the king gave a decree that this fast be. And even the animals, instead of any decorative type cut, covering upon them, were to be covered with sackcloth. Why? The king said, who can tell if God will turn and repent his fierce anger, his, turn away his fierce anger from us? You look at that, and you know, here's something. I get so aggravated when whenever you hear these things and people say, we need something better. You know, just preaching the Word isn't going to do it anymore. We've got to have a gimmick. We've got to have this. We've got to have that. We've got to go into all the social programs and such as that. God said, you go preach the bidding that I bid thee. And whenever he did that, it had an effect. You know, God has given us a word that he says is the power of God unto salvation. We have a better message than what Jonah had in that it is complete. It is based upon the sacrifice of his son. It is based upon that word which will never change. It will last until the end of the world. And we need to realize that while people say, oh, we need more, that we had best go on and keep on, as the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, 21, keep on with the foolishness of preaching. That's how God's going to save man. We're not going to do it with the entertainment, the social programs. Preach the preaching that I bid thee. And you see the power of it there. It convicted them of sin. And thankfully, they had the right response and cried out to God. Now God's response is set forth, showing Him as the merciful God who He is. Always has been and always will be. We're told God saw their works. They turned from their evil way. God repented of the evil that He had said He would do to them and He did it not. And by the way, that repentance isn't something that you know God is said not to change and He doesn't. But the fact is, His mercy is always there. He's ready to take those who come unto Him. And so the word repent there, it's called a big fancy word, anthropomorphism. All it means is there are attributes given to God that are like you and I. Repentance, joy, sorrow, tears, the eye of God, the ear of God. But God's a spirit. But we understand him better because of these attributes describing him. Same thing here. But all this does is show forth his divine justice. You find that the power of repentance is shown. God has told us in 1 John 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And some people say, well, you know, I've done something so bad. Well, none of it was pretty bad. You'll see the depth of God's forgiveness. Go over to Acts 2. Those individuals were convicted. They'd kill the Son of God. What must we do? Well, there's no way to be forgiven such a terrible thing, is there? Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise unto you, to your children, and those that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. That calling, by the way, according to Paul in the Thessalonian letter, by the word, power of the gospel again. But you look and you find that that is such an amazing thing that God, as he looks to mankind, his desire is so great, he wants us to be saved. No matter what nation you are, Jew, Gentile, doesn't matter. God is concerned and he's given away. And God is merciful. You look and you find in chapter 4 then, 
here's Jonah, and you'd think, you know, Jonah's just ecstatic. You know, the song that we sang, Here am I, Lord, send me, and looking and wanting to preach the gospel, wanting to save people. So Jonah, he preaches the word, and Nineveh repents, and Jonah is angry. You look at that and you think, how could that be? But it states specifically, it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was very angry. You know, one of the greatest privileges that you and I have is a privilege of prayer. To go to God, to know that he hears our prayer. I mean, he has sent his son. His son is the, the one through whom we pray and we know the prayer goes to God. And so it's agonizing to read verse 2 and 3 of chapter 4. Because you look, he says, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled unto Tarshish. For I knew thou art a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness, repentancy of evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take my life from me. You ever had a child look at you and talk back at you? You know, I try to read the Bible in the way that I think maybe that person said it. I read it to myself normally. And people think I'm crazy. But, but I read and I don't see that. Oh, God, I know that thou art a gracious God. You're merciful. He's saying it spitefully. God, I knew you was going to do this. You find commentators that are talking about, well, why did Jonah run? And they find all sorts of reasons. I tell you why he ran. Because he hated the Ninevites. He did not want them to be saved. He despised them. He was angry because God forgave them. I look and I, I sadly know people that way. You know, they look and they despise the wicked people and they say, I hope they go to hell. How can you say that? God so loved that person. I don't care how vile they are. The ones who murdered his own son. He loved them enough to give his son. Jesus loved them enough while they were yet entrenched in that sin to lay down his own life. And yet we have the gall, like Jonah, to be saying in the back of our mind, God, I hope you don't forgive those people. I hope they rot in darkness away from your presence. That's where Jonah was. And that's where we can get if we're not careful. You know, Jonah chastises God. And then he seeks to justify his actions in speaking against God by blaming God for being merciful. You think that is the most foolish thing. Look at our excuses. What, what excuse do we give when we don't obey God? We can dream them up, but they really come down to chastising God because he doesn't understand. He's not like we are. So I'm like Jonah. I'm running ahead of God. Don't need him anymore. I could handle this if he would just let me. But then God, you'd think at that point, God give up on Jonah. Say, I'm through with you. You're done. But instead, what he does, he fashions a gourd. Jonah goes off, and like a lot of people have done, he's over here pouting. He's just pouting, looking at the city, going to see what happens. He builds him a booth, covered. God brings forth a gourd. Didn't have to be cultivated and all. God brought it forth in one night. So now there's this gourd that is shadowing him. So allowing him some comfort. Then God sends a worm to destroy the gourd. Jonah's angry again. The gourd has died. God says, do us I well to be angry? Two times he asked Jonah that. But now he says, you're angry over the gourd? And not over this great city? You know, you ought to be rejoicing. You get angry because six to 700,000 people are going to live instead of die. And yet you're angry because the gourd died? He was seeking Jonah to see his priorities. 
You know one of the things we might do? What's the Lord in my life, in your life? What do you get angry about? Well, I see people, they're not ready. They're killing people. Why? Because somebody cut me off. Somebody drove in front of me. Somebody said this to me. Somebody did this to me. But whenever it's things pertaining to eternal life, oh, I don't, I don't talk about that. I don't get involved in that. See, somebody's got a big old gourd over them that they love more than the Lord. That they love more than the people that God gave his son to save. Jonah found himself in that predicament. What's our priority? One of the saddest things in this book is look at it and say, what happened to Jonah? Some people think that the very presence of the book means that he repented, that he turned to God. I don't know. I don't know what happened to Jonah. I know he was given the means to have introspection of what he had done, but what he did with that is a big question. I can't answer it for certain. But you know one question I can't answer? What am I going to do? I can look in the book. Maybe I'm running from God. Maybe I'm running to God. Maybe I'm running with God. Maybe I'm running ahead of God. Like I said, I think every one of us can find ourselves in that book someplace. But I can make the choice that I will, like Jonah made in the belly of that whale. I cry. And I can know that God hears me. If that's not where we are, we're doomed. You can profess, oh, I believe in God. I reverence God. I fear God. And then do things our own way like Jonah did. Or I can love God and keep his commandments. If you're not a child of God tonight, you know by virtue of Jesus being three days and three nights in the earth, just like Jonah was three days and three nights in the world, just because of that, you and I have the ability to go to God and receive that forgiveness of sin. What's our choice? I want to run with God, and I pray you will too as we stand and sing the song of invitation. Careless soul, why?